I'm excited to introduce our next speaker, Robert Spencer. Mr. Spencer is the director of Jihad Watch and is a Shillman Fellow at the David Horowitz Freedom Center. He is the author of 18 books, including the New York Times bestsellers, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades, and The Truth About Muhammad. His latest book is The History of Jihad from Muhammad to ISIS, just came out on Tuesday. Mr. Spencer received his master's degree in religious studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and has been studying Islamic theology, law, and history in depth since 1980. He is a weekly columnist for PJ Media and Front Page Magazine and has written hundreds of articles about jihad and Islamic terrorism. His articles on Islam and other topics have appeared in many well-known journals, including Los Angeles Times, The New York Post, and National Review. Mr. Spencer has led seminars on Islam and Jihad for many prestigious anti-terrorism agencies, including the FBI, the Justice Department's Anti-Terrorism Advisory Council, and the U.S. intelligence community. Mr. Spencer has been banned by the British government from entering the United Kingdom for pointing out that Islam has doctrines of violence against unbelievers. He has been invited by name to convert to Islam by a senior member of Al-Qaeda. He has survived not only death threats, but actual death attempts as well. In 2017, he spoke at the Grand Hotel in Reykjavik, Iceland, and was poisoned that night at dinner. I had the privilege of introducing Mr. Spencer at our conference this past June. Right before his speech, I quickly asked him, what keeps you going? You've been banned from the UK and people have tried to take your life. He looked out at the large crowd of high schoolers and said, I do it for them. They are our future and they deserve to know the truth. Mr. Spencer is determined that nothing will get in his way of declaring the truth even when his life is at risk. And he does so with you in mind. He is a frequent speaker for our conferences here at Young America's Foundation and we are so excited to have him back here with us today. I encourage you all to ask questions because it is such a privilege to have him uh, be able to speak with us. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Robert Spencer. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That's a very generous introduction and I much appreciate it. It's always great to be at YAF. It's the best organization in the country and you are all very privileged to be here. In any case, I uh, wanted to begin by telling you Last night, I met up with an old friend, and we watched a movie. And it was an old Western, you know, a lot of gunfighting and shooting and such. And uh, in the middle of the movie, my friend turned to me, and he said, I bet you $50 this guy's going to get shot off his horse in a few minutes. And I said, OK, I'll take that bet. And sure enough, a few minutes later, the guy got shot off his horse. And my friend, I was about to pay. I was reaching for my wallet, and my friend said, look, I have a confession to make. I've seen this movie before. And I said, well, so have I, but I didn't think he was stupid enough to make the same mistake twice. <laughs> and that, my friends, kind of sums up American foreign policy. We are constantly making the same mistakes twice. We are continually falling into the same traps. And so I thought that in order to illustrate that today, I would take you on a lightning tour of a subject that I've been spending quite a lot of time on lately, uh, the history of jihad. Now, jihad is a concept in the Islamic religion, and it means struggle. And there are all kinds of struggles in the Islamic context, just like there are in English. You can struggle to do small things, and you can struggle to do great things, and it's all the same word. But the primary meaning of jihad in the Islamic religion is warfare against unbelievers, people who do not believe in Islam, in order to bring them under the rule of Islamic law. And Islamic law denies basic rights, the freedom of speech, the freedom of conscience, the equality of rights of women, the equality of rights of other groups. It denies basic rights that we take for granted in the West. And a lot of this is founded on the Islamic holy book, the Quran, which says many things about this. And one of them that, that says, in chapter 9, verse 29, if you want to open your Qur'an so that you could follow along, fight those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day, and do not forbid what has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, 
and do not acknowledge the religion of truth, even if they are of the people of the book. The people of the book, the Quran primarily means Jews and Christians. And it goes on to say, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Jizya is a tax. And in traditional Islamic law, non-Muslims have to pay a tax to the Muslims. The Muslims don't pay it. The non-Muslims essentially owe the Muslims their upkeep. And in the ideal Islamic state, the Muslims don't even work. The non-Muslims pay for everything. And this is based on this idea. It also is accompanied by various humiliating and discriminatory regulations that ensure that the non-Muslims feel the pain every day of not having converted to Islam, so that ultimately they will convert to Islam. And then all the discrimination, they can't hold authority over Muslims, they can't build new churches or house, other houses of worship or repair old ones, they have to step off the street if a Muslim is coming, all, and pay the tax primarily, all these things go away if they convert. But ultimately, the jihad is to subjugate the non-Muslims and make them into these second class not even citizens, but they're called protected people or dhimmis, and they <laughs> submit to the Muslims in various ways and are relegated to an inferior status in society. Now, you can say at this point, well, all right, the Quran says that, and that was 1400 years ago, but now I know all sorts of wonderful Muslims who don't do that, and people tell us that we have to be very careful about Islamophobia, so what exactly are you getting into here? I think in order to answer that, we need to look at how have Muslims understood this throughout history. Like I say, we don't have much time today. It's going to be a lightning tour. And we're going to start with the invasion of Persia. Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, died in 632, according to Islamic tradition. And after that, the armies of Islam poured out of Arabia and conquered with incredible speed all of North Africa, all of the Middle East, and Persia, which was one of the great powers of the day and then went into Spain and into India, such that by 732, 100 years after Muhammad died, they had controlled this huge empire that stretched from Spain all the way across North Africa and the Middle East into Persia and into India, and were enforcing these laws subjugating the non-Muslims. Al-Numan ibn Makarin in the 630s, when the Muslims first invaded Persia, he explained to the Persian king the Shah, we are inviting you to embrace our religion. This is a religion which approves of all that is good and rejects all that is evil. If you refuse our invitation, you must pay the jizya. That's that tax again. That is a bad thing, but it's not as bad as the alternative. If you refuse, it will be war. So that was in the 630s. Now we can fast forward to the 1100s, the 12th century, when another Muslim leader, the Fatimid Caliph Al-Amir bi Ahmillah, he said this, and he was a leader in Egypt, and there were a lot of non-Muslims in Egypt in those days, a lot of Christians, also Jews, and he said, the prior degradation of the infidels, that is, those who are not Muslims, before the life to come, which is their lot, that's what they deserve, is considered an act of piety. So see, he's saying to degrade non-Muslims is a religious act. It's a good thing to do. And the imposition of the poll tax, the jizya, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued is a divinely ordained obligation. So he's saying we have to do this. We have to humiliate and subjugate these people. It's our duty before God. Same thing, a little bit later, we have Tamerlane, who was the famous Mongol leader who was also a Muslim in the early 1400s. He was invading uh, parts of India that had not yet been conquered. And he said, my object in the invasion of Hindustan is to lead a campaign against the infidels, to convert them to the true faith according to the command of the prophet, to purify the land from the defilement of unbelief, and overthrow the temples and the idols. And he did destroy many, many Hindu temples. Then also we have in the United States, do you know that the first war that the United States fought was against Islamic jihadis? Have you ever heard that? You have heard that. That is very good. There are not many people. A lot of people don't know that nowadays. But in the early part of the 19th century, 1801 to 1805, the United States fought a war against the Barbary pirates, they were called. They were uh, pirate ships out of Morocco and Algeria. 
that were boarding American ships, killing or enslaving the crews, demanding money. We paid the money for a while because it seemed like the thing to do. And then Thomas Jefferson and John Adams went to England and they met with the Moroccan ambassador there. And they wrote a report to Congress. And they said, this is what they said. They said, what are you doing this for? Why are you harassing our ships? We don't have anything against you. Why are you bothering us? And the Moroccan ambassador answered, that, well, this is Thomas Jefferson reporting to Congress. The ambassador answered us that it was founded on the laws of the prophet, that it was written in their Quran, that all nations who have not answered their authority were sinners, that it was their right and duty to make war upon them wherever they could be found and to make slaves of all they could take as prisoners, and that every Muslim who should be killed in battle was sure to go to paradise. Fast forward again to 2016 not too long ago, and Pope Francis, the uh, head of the Catholic Church, had said that Islam was a religion of peace and had nothing to do with terrorism. He said that the authentic understanding of Islam and the proper reading of the Quran rejected every form of violence. And ISIS, you've ever heard of ISIS, the terrorist group? Not the goddess, the terrorist group. It's uh, an acronym for the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, but actually they, uh, their official name is just the Islamic State because they're not just claiming Iraq and Syria, they're claiming the whole world. They actually answered the Pope and said, nope, you're wrong. They said, we hate you. Charming people, these. And they said, we hate you first and foremost because you are disbelievers. You reject the oneness of Allah, whether you realize it or not making partners for him in worship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And finally concluding, the fact is, even if you were to stop bombing us, imprisoning us, torturing us, vilifying us, and usurping our lands, we would continue to hate you. Because our primary reason for hating you will not cease to exist until you embrace Islam. So I just gave you, in about five minutes, examples from a broad spectrum of history every few hundred years for 14 centuries of Muslim leaders making war against non-Muslims and saying we are bound to do this, it's our duty before the Prophet and before Allah that we have to fight against you and either convert you to Islam or subjugate you as second class under the rule of Islamic law. Now this is why I told you about the movie last night because you see this has been the same for 14 centuries. The jihad imperative never changes. And yet nowadays, we are in a position where the expert foreign policy analysts who have been in charge, for the most part, over every country in the Western world since World War II, they all say, no, it's going to be different this time. The guy's not going to get shot off his horse this time. This time, we're going to bring massive numbers of Muslims into the West, and there's not going to be any jihad, there's not going to be any violence, everybody is going to be happy together and go forward into wonderfully diverse, multicultural, harmonious future. Now, you might be saying, but wait a minute, I do know, my friend Ahmed's a beautiful guy, he would never do any of this, he wouldn't hurt a fly, how could you be saying this? You're so Islamophobic. All right, in the first place, what I'm talking to you about is Islamic doctrine, the teachings of Islam. You, many of you probably, most of you are Christians. You may have, some of you may be very committed and very familiar with Christianity and you know that Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you and if somebody strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other one so he can strike that one too, right? Now, and I tell you, you probably know many Christians who don't do that, who don't love their enemies and all the rest of it. But that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't say it. And it doesn't mean that it is still not a duty of Christians to behave in a magnanimous manner even toward people who hate them. And it's the same thing in Islam, only in reverse in a certain sense. There, human nature being everywhere the same, there are wonderful individual Muslims who exhibit the most wonderful qualities that any human beings can exhibit. That does not change the fact that the teachings of the Islamic religion include an imperative to wage war against unbelievers, whether or not any individual Muslim takes up that imperative or not. Do you see the distinction? 
This is a very key distinction because when you talk about these things and you speak about what the Quran says and what's happened in Islamic history throughout the ages, without any reformation, rejection, reconsideration, nothing, it's all still there, people will say, oh, you're anti-Muslim. Well, that's ridiculous, no. That would be like saying that the people who fought against the Nazis during World War II were anti-German. And so as you go into college and you encounter this, I hope that you will remember that and stand up for decent and humane values regarding the right for people to ha exercise their freedom of conscience, to believe in what the, the religion that they are committed to or no religion at all, and not to be harassed or subjected to violence on that basis. But in any case, nowadays there is a massive influx of refugees into Europe. Have you heard of this? Yes. Have you heard that the refugees were mostly, were fleeing a war in Syria? Only have you heard that over 50% of them are not Syrian? And just today, for example, I heard about in the UK a Turkish refugee who has been charged with various crimes. And I was thinking, wait a minute, what war is going on in Turkey right now that he would have be a refugee from? There isn't any. And the refugees have come from all kinds of places where there's no war, there's nothing that they need to be taking refuge from. So you gotta wonder about that. But also, that same ISIS group that was telling the Pope how much they hated him and why, they also vowed in February 2015, just before this refugee influx started, that they were going to infiltrate the refugee stream. They said, as a matter of fact, that they were going to send 500,000 refugees into Europe. This was before there was even one of them. Then, by September, there were coming refugees into Europe, more than 500,000. Do you think there might have been any connection? The Lebanese interior minister said, right around the same time, that there were all sorts of people in refugee camps in his country waiting to go to Europe. And he said among them are 30,000 at least active jihad terrorists. In November 2015, there were, was a jihad terror attack in Paris and 130 people were killed by eight jihad terrorists. And all eight of them had just come into Europe as refugees in October 2015. So, are you starting to see a pattern that ISIS vowed to infiltrate the refugee stream. There have been jihad attacks by refugees, even in the United States. Did you hear about in San Bernardino, California, a few years back, there was a Christmas party and uh, two Muslims, a married couple, went in and shot it up, killed 15 people. And the wife, Tashfin Malik, of that couple, she was a refugee. She had been vetted by five different US agencies and they all gave her a clean slate. So she was able to come into the country. And then she went jihad. The thing is, everywhere that there has been a large number of Muslims, there has been conflict throughout history. Why do we think it's gonna be different now? Why do we think the same movie is gonna play here, but the ending's gonna be different? It's the same print. Now, what then do we do about that? Obviously, we have to act in accord with our own principles and our own commitment to human rights and to the equality and dignity of all people. And so we cannot give in to any temptation, if we have one, to start behaving in the same way as those who have vowed to destroy us do. But what we need to do, as a matter of fact, is something that I think is one of the key principles that is the lesson that you're probably hearing from a lot of the speakers over these days, and that is that we need to recover an appreciation for our own values. And what does that have to do with this? We have laws that if they were enforced, then the people who were breaking them would be caught and prosecuted. But for the most part, they are not being enforced. For example, there is a uh, practice that is in Islamic law, that is validated by Islamic law. 
that is uh, called circumcision for women, for females. And it's really a very sort of barbaric thing. I don't want to get into it, uh, obviously, too graphically, but it is designed to essentially to control women and to reduce them to a, uh, an inferior status. And it can be very painful and have immense health risks. But because Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, said that this was something that should be done, there are many Muslims who practice it. It's against the law in the United States. But only now are there two doctors in Detroit who are being prosecuted for it. It's the first time, even though this law's been on the books for many years, it's the first time anybody's ever been arrested for it. Now, there are estimates that there, that there are millions upon millions of women around the world who have been subjected to this, and yet only now is anybody being arrested. Now, why is that? Because I think the answer is clear from what the defense is from one of the doctors. One of the doctors, Dr. Jumana Nagarwala, has said that she's going to base her defense on the idea of religious freedom, that the First Amendment grants religious freedom to Americans, and that she was exercising a religious ritual, something that is called for in her religion, and therefore it's perfectly fine, and it has to be allowed. Now, consider that. Do you think that the Founding Fathers, when they wrote the Bill of Rights, and they put the First Amendment in there, and the First Amendment said that there would be, Congress will make no infringement upon the freedom of religion, the practice of religion, and that that has been understood, interpreted by numerous courts as not just referring to Congress, but being a general law for authorities in the United States. Do you think that they really meant it to be a license to break other laws? Do you think that because somebody could claim religious freedom for killing someone or injuring someone or mutilating someone, that therefore it should be allowed? What we need to do, you see, is understand that religious freedom is part of the framework of the Constitution, which is meant to preserve and protect and defend the United States. And so it ends where other laws begin. This is actually already a principle in American law. In 1890, the territory of Utah, anybody here from Utah? No. Well, it's a very nice place. Visit. But in any case, the territory of Utah petitioned to become a state. Now, Utah was and is the center of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. And in those days, the Mormons taught polygamy, multiple wives, that a man could have more than one wife. And this was considered by many to be something that was wrong because it was an affront to the human dignity of women, reducing them vis-a-vis -vis men to the status of commodities. And so actually the United States Supreme Court and the United States government declared that unless and until the Mormon church and the, state of, and, and the territory of Utah outlawed polygamy, it could not become a state. And nobody said, wait a minute, this is our religious freedom. And so you have to grant this because they understood that religious freedom was something that could be limited in terms of the national interest. It was not a license to break laws or a suicide pact, a suicide pill built into the Constitution to destroy the country. So Utah outlawed polygamy and became a state. So there is precedent, in other words, for saying that something may be a religion, but if your religion is calling for warfare and subjugation and the oppression of women and such, well then, you can leave those things at the door. You're perfectly, will, perfectly welcome to practice Islam in ways that are completely compatible with American laws, just like everybody else. And every other religious group understands this. The thing is this, that there is this imperative to make war and to conquer and to subjugate within the Islamic religion. There have been Muslims, not all Muslims, but some enough to make it a constant war for 1400 years all around the world. These imperatives still remain. There are some Muslims in the United States 
who are still pushing forward these imperatives. Once again, not all, but some. For example, a few years back there was an Islamic charity in the United States called the Holy Land Foundation. It's been shut down now for funneling the charitable contributions to the terrorist group Hamas. When it was shut down, and uh, well, actually when it was first accused and it, the trial was being prepared, the FBI raided their offices, carted out boxes and boxes of documents. And one of the documents they found was a program of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is an international Muslim organization, and it was their strategic goals for the United States. And it said that the brothers must understand that their work in America is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house so that it falls and Allah's religion is victorious over other religions. And it listed all the major Muslim groups in the United States without exception as partners in this effort. And as it happens, if you look at the record of, say, the Council on American-Islamic Relations, the Islamic Society of North America, the other major Muslim organizations in the U.S., including the Muslim Students Association, which you're likely to encounter in college if you haven't already, as partners in this effort, and every, if you look at the record of every one of those organizations, they all have opposed every counter-terror measure that has ever been proposed or implemented anywhere, without any exceptions. And there was, for example, a big effort by the Council on American-Islamic Relations and a few others a few years back to stop an effort in New York City of surveillance in mosques and in Islamic uh, neighborhoods that had already stopped several terror plots. But the Islamic groups argued that Muslims were no more likely to commit acts of terrorism than any other group Amish, Presbyterians, whatever. And so the program was dismantled. Now, the problem is that when you've got a program that says what we're going to do is work at eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within, and then you see efforts like that, it's kind of hard not to think, hmm, there may be a connection. What better way to eliminate and destroy Western civilization from within and sabotage its miserable house than to make people ashamed of defending or unable to defend themselves? And ashamed to defend themselves is actually going on as well. Uh, have you ever heard the term Islamophobia? Yes. And there is the claim nowadays that Muslims are subject to widespread persecution, discrimination, and harassment in the United States. Have you ever heard this? Well, it's entirely false. FBI hate crime statistics show that Jews are actually far more likely to be subjected to hate attacks than Muslims are. Now, no hate attack against any innocent person is ever justified. But the idea that there's some wave of victimization of innocent Muslims is just not borne out by the facts. What this is is yet another attempt to make people unable to defend themselves. And what you have with the Islamophobia scam is an attempt to make people ashamed of being against jihad terrorism, against this oppression of women, against the oppression of other groups, against the idea of warfare based on religion, and all that. And it works great. You know, I, uh, I, I speak at uh, colleges and universities now and again when YAF is able to uh, help a college group to get me there, and usually it's, it's, there's a huge uproar. It's as if, you know, Jack the Ripper's coming to campus. And I guarantee you that at any of these colleges and universities where I've spoken in the last few years, if a Al-Qaeda member from Guantanamo came to the campus and screamed death to America, they would celebrate him as a hero. And this is the topsy-turvy world that we live in. But reality is that this is a 1,400-year imperative. It is being pursued today. And these people are trying to make us think that if we hit ourselves on the head with a mallet 10 times and we're starting to get a headache, that if we hit ourselves on the head with the mallet 11 or 12 times, it won't hurt. 
It's always been the same. It's always going to be the same. The imperative for jihad is embedded within the Islamic texts. It's still there, and there are Muslims still acting upon it. So we need to deal with it realistically. We need to call upon American Muslim groups to renounce the aspects of Islam that are at variance with constitutional principles, to teach against the understanding of Islam in Islamic schools and mosques, that to teach against in those places the aspects of the understanding of Islam that's put forward by ISIS and Al-Qaeda, to back up, they always condemn terror attacks, but they never do anything to prevent the next one, to start doing that, to be active in resisting the spread of this ideology and putting teeth putting reality behind their claims to be completely loyal and accepting of constitutional principles and freedoms. This is the way forward, but we have to, in the first place, even admit that there is a problem, that Islam is not actually a religion of peace and Islamophobia is not nearly the problem that jihad terror is before we can go forward. So I hope that as you continue or as you become activists in your schools, activists for the truth, that you will stand for this and always insist on the truth being spoken about these issues and not accept these lies and propaganda that blanket college campuses today. But always remember as you do this, you will get abuse, you will be called all these terrible names. And the thing about it is that you do have one invincible weapon on your side and that is the truth. That if you are speaking about these issues, if you speak about them accurately and honestly, reality will dawn on people. It's, it will always break through. There have been 30, over 33,000 jihad terror attacks around the world since 9-11. How many people have been victimized by Islamophobia in that span? Maybe one or two. Maybe. There have been a lot of exaggerated cases and claims of victimhood that turned out to be falsified. Uh, there was a very famous case right after the election when there was a girl wearing a hijab, the headscarf on her head as is mandated in Islamic law and she was riding on the New York City subway and she said it was a very crowded subway car and a couple of guys in Trump hats, Make America Great Again hats came up and they started abusing her and calling her names and finally they ripped off her hijab and nobody came to help her in the crowded subway car. Have you ever been on the New York subway? No? Wow. Anyway, go. But uh, let me ask you this, though, actually more to the point. Have, do you have a phone on you? Does it take video? Do you think that if the subway car that holds like a couple hundred people or a, a hundred people, whatever, that if there was this altercation going on in the middle of the car that somebody might have videoed? No video appeared. She made it all up. She was ultimately charged with filing a false police report, but this is only after it made international headlines. The thing is, the truth does come out eventually, but we need to work it. There's an old expression that the lie goes twice around the world before the truth is finished putting on its shoes. And we just need to work a little harder to put on our shoes. But the thing is that the truth does always break out. And if you stand for it and you point people to reality, then there's no way you can lose. So I urge you in the final, last thing I'm going to say here is that you need to be strong and courageous. And it is virtuous and good to be strong and courageous. It is better to die standing up than to live on one's knees, as a great man once said. And so, as you go into college, I urge you to not let yourself be intimidated by the organized forces of the left that you will find there. And don't let yourself bam be bamboozled by their lies and propaganda and deception and false claims of victimhood. If you stand with the truth, ultimately, it may be very difficult, but ultimately you cannot lose. Thank you very much. Now, you have questions, comments, death fatwas? I'm right here. And if you don't, I'll think of some other jokes, and maybe that'll make you come up with some questions. So we have a question for one of our virtual pass attendees. Yes, hello, virtual pass attendee. <laughs> this is from Sant D. Gupta from University of Florida. 
And she asks, how do you project radical Islam will affect Europe and North America in the next five years? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, how will it affect Europe and North America in the next five years? It's not going to be pretty. Uh, what you have is the fact that Islam is more than just a religion. It is a political system. Islam is unique among world religions in having a system of laws for everything. And that includes politics, society, governance, the way a state should be ordered, all of that. And those aspects of Islamic law, Sharia, are considered to be just as much divinely ordained and therefore perfect and unchangeable as the religious laws. And so also the Quran tells Muslims, you are the best of people on the earth. It's chapter 3, verse 110. And it says of the non-Muslims, you are the most vile of created beings, that they are the most vile of created beings. It's chapter 98, verse 6. So the best of people on earth, and the passage actually goes on to say, you are the best of people on earth in joining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. So the best of people know what's right and wrong. The most vile of created beings don't. So the point is, they come to Europe. You have a lot of them, here again, not all. You never have 100% of anything. In Europe, you have Muslim migrants coming, many of whom think that they have a way that the society should be ordered that's better than the way it is in Europe, that their laws are superior to the laws of the most vile of created beings in Europe, and that therefore they should work to replace the one with the other. That's going to cause trouble. It already has. There are already major areas in Europe where Islamic law is essentially in place, and the laws of the land are ignored. And the, the big mistake, so you know I said in the talk, we need to enforce our own laws. One of the reasons why I said that and emphasized it is because that's not being done, particularly in Europe. In Europe especially, and in the UK, whether you think that's part of Europe or not, I'm not sure they're, they're really sure of that right now for themselves. The laws of Islam are respected to the extent that the laws of the land are set aside when they contradict. There are Sharia courts, Islamic legal courts, in the UK. And the thing about it is, is that the Quran says, good women are obedient. As for those from whom you fear disobedience, give them a warning, se send them to separate beds, and beat them. Beat them. There's spousal abuse in all cultures, but only in Islam is it divinely sanctioned. And so the women who are beaten in, in Britain, they've gone to the Sharia courts, and the Sharia courts say, go back and try to be better to your husband so he doesn't beat you. They don't refer them to the criminal courts as they should. And this is the problem. There's a direct contradiction between the Western idea of spousal abuse as something to be prosecuted and the Islamic idea that if you have a bad woman, you beat her. Those things are going to clash. And so that what I predict in Europe is civil strife, conflict, maybe blood in the streets in the next five years. I hope that doesn't happen. I'm not calling for it. But they have brought this on themselves by bringing in massive numbers of people who have this idea that their law is superior to the law of the land to which they're coming and not insisting on assimilation or acceptance of the mores of the host country on the part of the migrants. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, so I was going to ask, it's obvious that our immigration system right now and in Europe is flawed, and um, our system of taking in refugees is obviously just not optimal, and it really just hasn't been updated in all these years. So in your opinion, what do you think would make a good uh, refugee and immigration system so we don't get as many, um, or if possible, none at all, uh, radical terrorists? Well, you know, Donald Trump Jr., uh, last year, he said, if you have a bowl of M&Ms, there's 100 M&Ms in it, and 10 of them are poison, and they're just all mixed up, are you just going to grab a big handful and eat them? Obviously not. And yet, that's what we're doing with immigration, because the unpleasant fact is that there is no discernible way, there is no way to distinguish a jihadi from a peaceful Muslim. How do you think Tashfeen Malik, the San Bernardino shooter, passed those five separate background checks? She was able to pose as somebody who was peaceful and harmless. She knew what to say. She knew how to answer the questions. It's the same thing with those eight guys in Paris who were refugees, and then they went and killed 130 people. They knew how to play the immigration officials. So you see, this was the choice that the president had when he imposed his travel ban. 
the travel ban is on a limited number of countries, specific countries, where the governments cannot or will not give us enough information about the people that are trying to come in so that we can try to screen them. And so he wants to ban immigrants from them, from those places. It's a perfectly reasonable national security issue. For example, I mean, this is what it comes down to. You have two choices, really. You either let in a whole lot of people, and among them are going to be some harmful people among the harmless ones. And for years, we've been told, we have to do that, or else we're racists and bigots and the scum of the earth. Or you say, because we cannot tell the harmful people from the harmless ones, we're just going to have a moratorium on this for a while until we can figure out some way to distinguish the two. And that's what the president has opted for. It's a wise course that is designed to protect Americans and will protect Americans. There are innumerable cases. There's so many cases of uh, migrants, immigrants who came here perfectly legally, and then they end up committing acts of violence. It's foolhardy to bring in more. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, my, my name is Adam Huser. I'm from uh, Providence Academy in Ma Minnesota. Uh, my question Minnesota. is... Minnesota. Is yeah. Keith Ellison your congressman? Uh, no. Well, that's good. You're a lucky man. Thank Keith you. Ellison is uh, uh, the first Muslim congressman in the uh, House of Representatives, which would be neither here nor there, except he, uh, he accepted a few years back... Excuse me. I'll get right no. to you. He, a few years back, he accepted $13,000 from the Muslim American Society to go on the pilgrimage to Mecca that's obligatory for all Muslims. The Muslim American Society is the American arm of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is dedicated to, in its own words, according to that captured internal document I told you about, eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within. And he's a liberal Democrat congressman. You connect the dots. Um, my question is, you've talked about how we can prevent people in our country from becoming threats and how we can prevent threats <coughs> from coming into our country. What would be your advice as to dealing with uh, threats outside of our country, such as countries that follow Sharia law? That's a superb question. I would say that what we need is a massive reconfiguration of our international alliances such that we ally with the states or strengthen our alliances with the states that are threatened by jihad as we are and that we end uh, the alliances that are generally sham alliances that we have with states that are actually on the other side. The most notorious example of this, my friends, is Pakistan. In Pakistan, the uh, same Taliban and Al-Qaeda that struck on 9-11 in the United States, they're actually very popular there. And right after 9-11, President George W. Bush met with President Musharraf of Pakistan and pledged $1.3 billion every year to Pakistan to, so they would fight Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And we paid them this $1.3 billion every year, okay? 2008, about five years after this, after this arrangement began, there was the revelation that the Pakistani government was taking a lot of that money that was supposed to be used to fight Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and giving it to, can you guess, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. They took the money that we, that we gave them to fight them and they gave it to them. And you know what the US Congress did when they found out about this? I mean, I can't believe this to this day. I think this, no, you must be making that up. It's real, you can check it out. They gave more money to Pakistan. I guess they figured, well, after they pay off Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, then they can use the increased money we're giving them to fight Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. It's a, such a ridiculous thing. And the Pakistani government is up to its eyebrows in jihad terror plotting. They have been accused by the government of India in being involved in the Mumbai massacre. Many, many people were killed there about 10 years ago. And Pakistani government officials have been allegedly involved in planning that. And that's not the only time either. This is a rogue state, and it is a state that's committed to jihad. We are not their allies. They are not our friends. They are using us, and we should stop it. 
Turkey is another. Turkey, for many years, was a secular government, and it was a reliable ally in NATO, the whole nine yards. But the President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey, he is committed to Islam, to restoring the caliphate, which Turkey used to be the seat of, and the caliphate is the only legitimate government to which Muslims owe allegiance, according to Sunni Muslim theology. Sunni Muslims are about 85 to 90 percent of Muslims worldwide. And there is no caliphate right now, and so there is no single government to which all Muslims owe allegiance. Erdogan wants to restore it and reclaim the lands that the Ottoman Empire once controlled. And so he's actually said that we own by right, these lands belong to us, Greece, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, North Africa. He's laid claim to them. This is a dangerous character, and he's by no means a friend of the United States. So we need to instead strengthen our alliances with India and our alliance with India, with the states that, with the Kurds that the, that the Turks are fighting, with others who are facing the jihad. That would be a whole lot more sensible. And I think that the president has made some step, taken some steps in that direction, defunding the uh, Palestinian Authority to some degree, which has this genocidal rhetoric on Palestinian television all the time and has no interest in actually making peace with the Israelis and uh, putting the Pakistanis on notice as well. So I hope he's able to follow through with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I got a million of them. Yes. Hello. Uh, I'm Isaac Osborne. Isaac? Isaac? Yeah. Isaac, how are you doing? Good. Um, can you explain the concept of taqiyya? And yes. Can, and can we truly <coughs> trust any Muslim in or out of our country? I'm sorry. That last bit was, can we truly trust any Muslim in or out of our country? Oh, goodness. Well, you know, like I said earlier, human nature is everywhere the same. And you really can only make that judgment on a case-by-case -case basis. But I can give you, and I will give you, the idea of taqiyya. Taqiyya is uh, concealing. There is a certain kind of hat that's called a taqiyya because it covers up your bald spot. But not yours, mine. But uh, taqiyya in Islamic theology, it comes from chapter 3, verse 28 of the Quran. And that says, do not take unbelievers as your friends and protectors in preference to believers. Whoever does this has nothing to do with the law, unless you're doing it to guard yourselves against them. So what's that bit of it, unless you're doing it to guard yourselves against them? If you look at the classic commentaries on the Quran, what Islamic scholars have said that it means, they say that means, in the words of one of the companions of Muhammad, one of the earliest followers of the founder and prophet of Islam, we smile in the faces of some people, but behind their backs we curse them. And I, uh, I didn't actually bring it today because I was too lazy to carry two books. But I have a Quran that I usually bring to these things that has commentary by a very respected Islamic scholar. And he says that in his commentary on that verse that this means that if the Muslims are hard pressed, they can behave in such a way as to give the impression that they're on the same side as their enemies. And I think, well, that's the government of Pakistan to a T. So anyway, that's taqiyya. Taqiyya is religiously sanctioned deception that Muslims, when they feel under pressure or confronted by enemies of Islam or people they perceive to be enemies of Islam, they can deceive them for the greater good of Islam. And so is it possible that you are being lied to by any given Muslim spokesman? Well, that's especially true when you're talking to people from some of these organizations like CARE or the Muslim American Society where they're Muslim Brotherhood organizations. But if you're talking to your pal in, in class, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't, should distrust every individual. You have to make that decision yourself. Because remember, religious dogma is one thing, and the person's heart is the other thing. And they're not necessarily the same thing. Like I said about the Christians who don't love their enemies and turn the other cheek. You can't be sure that just because Islam teaches something that that means a Muslim is down with it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I tell you, I'm going to get a swelled head from this applause after every question thing. This, this is nice. Yes. We have another question from a virtual past attendee. This is Ben Lowe from Oklahoma. Ben? Ben. And he asks, 
Our constitution guarantees the free exercise of religion, yet the basic tenets of Islam, if freely exercised, would jeopardize American safety. How would we deal with this, both as, neighbor, or both as Americans and neighbors? Well, Ben, I think I've kind of already answered that because, uh, yeah, what you're dealing with is a radically intolerant ideology. And it's interesting that when you note, you know that the Congress, uh, the First Amendment guarantees the free exercise of religion. Well, Islam doesn't because it mandates that the uh, people of the book be subjugated as dhimmis under the rule of Islamic law and denied basic rights. So how do you have that if you have people who believe that in a country that is guaranteeing the free exercise of religion? Of course, what people believe is one thing, but if they start to act upon it, then it becomes something that's a matter of grave concern. And so this is why I, I uh, have been saying for quite some time now uh, over the years that we need to challenge the Islamic advocacy groups about these aspects of Islam and make it very clear that the aspects of Islam that contradict constitutional principles and American freedoms are not acceptable here any more than any other group's practices that are in contradiction to American law would be or are tolerated. You cannot tolerate a radically intolerant force without being destroyed. And so it's ultimately come down, going to come down to whether we're going to choose to affirm our own identity as enunciated by the Constitution or surrender and become dhimmis under an Islamic state. But there really isn't a whole lot of neutral ground in between when you get down to the choice because of the fact that Islam does indeed deny the freedom of speech, which is guaranteed in the Constitution, denies the equality of rights of women, which is something that's guaranteed in numerous ways in American law. Those things are not compatible. This is not to say here again that any individual Muslim may not be able to live in the United States, but it depends on if he's trying to subvert or destroy the freedoms that we have under the Constitution, then that should not be welcome. But if he is not, has no intention to, is working against that sort of thing, then there's no problem. Yes, sir. Hi, my name's John. I'm from Westlake Village, California, and I go to uh, Agora High School. And I just wanted to, get, uh, I wanted to get your take on the current uh, situation in the UK right now and their um, whole thing with the Islam and their courts. And if you know, do you know who Tommy Robinson is? I do indeed. And I want, what, did, what do you think about the whole situation going on with him being arrested? But now, I guess he was released a week ago, but he was in prison for about a month for uh, exposing some horrific stuff going on in the UK. Yeah, what happened is this. I'll give you a little background. Tommy Robinson is uh, a, a man in the UK who, a few years back, he noticed that the British soldiers returning from Iraq and Afghanistan were actually being abused and spat upon and reviled by Muslims in the UK as they were walking out of the airport and going home, coming back from their deployment. And so he started a thing called the English Defense League that was designed to, meant to protect the troops as they were coming out. And it was a little bit rough, and they got into some fights, and he was accused of being a Nazi and a racist and a bigot, and he denied all that and very strongly affirmed that he was for the basic principles of British society and Western civilization. Uh, and he got into a whole lot of trouble, and in any case, Fast forwarding to the recent thing, what happened was this. There has been this terrible phenomenon because the Quran, the holy book of Islam, it allows for the, uh, I, I, I hate to get into these unpleasant topics, I'm sorry, but this is the nature of the case. The uh, Quran allows for the uh, sexual slavery, sex slaves of infidel women, women who are not Muslims. You can look this up in chapter 4, verse 3, chapter 4, verse 24, chapter 23, verses 1 to 6, chapter 33, verse 50, and chapter 70, verse 30. Just in case you want to check up on me, you'll find it in there, the captives of the right hand. Anyway, there has been consequently a phenomenon in England and in the UK in general of Muslim gangs kidnapping or coercing or sweet-talking little girls, sometimes 10 years old, 11 years old, very young girls, and making them into prostitutes. This has happened to thousands of girls in Britain, and authorities had done nothing for years because they were afraid of being called racist and Islamophobic. And so Tommy Robinson was outside the trial of one of these. 
and he was uh, live streaming. You know what that means better than I do. And the British authorities came and told him to stop because they were embarrassed by the fact that they had failed to protect these girls for so many years. And so he went back and did it again. And he was arrested and summarily given, a, uh, within five hours, given a 13-month jail sentence. And he was harassed in prison by the Muslim inmates. And they would taunt him and say, how's your dinner, Tommy? And he realized, oh, they've poisoned his food. He stopped eating. Uh, they wouldn't let him buy food from the commissary. They very clearly want him gone. Britain is, in short, rapidly uh, degenerating into a police state where any dissent from the government's program of appeasing the Islamic groups and mass Muslim migration is ruthlessly prosecuted. And they're terrible stories in many cases. There was some guy and he put bacon in front of a mosque. And I think, you know, stuff like that is stupid and, you know, grow up, all right? But anyway, he put bacon in front of the mosque. He got a year in prison and he was actually murdered in prison. And there have been a lot of these uh, rapists and others who are Muslims, and they get off. There was a guy who uh, was involved. Oh, I forget actually what he did, but he didn't speak English well, and they let him off for that because they said he would have a hard time in prison. And uh, the, 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 there, there's such an incredible double standard with the Muslim and the non-Muslim populace in Britain that it's getting to be a very serious situation there. And we could be seeing the end of Britain as a free society unless the people are able to bring about massive political change quickly, which I hope they're able to do in a peaceful manner. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Hi. Spencer. My name is Sabrina. I Sabrina. go to Oaks. Hi. Are you a teenage witch? No, I'm not, sadly. <laughs> That's probably a good. But anyway, I think so. Yes. <laughs> Um, so actually, two years ago, I wanted to start with, um, I wrote an essay comparing jihad to the Crusades for my school. Hey, that's great. Yeah, and I actually... Well, actually, I haven't read it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it was for... A I figure if you're Christian here, essay. it was probably good. Yes. Um, and I used both of your books as my main, like, resources for my Thanks. essay. And so I wanted to say it was a great book. Books. Thank you. And uh, my question is... Why is the left so quick to defend the terrorists if they're yeah, doing the one. things that they do? Why is the left so quick to defend the terrorists? Uh, I think that what we're seeing nowadays is what the uh, conservatives have accused the left of for many years. David Horowitz was uh, a very prominent socialist in the 1960s, and he woke up in the 70s and became a conservative activist. I've had the honor of being affiliated with his organization for about the last uh, 12 years. And he has spoken many times about the anti-American left. And people have said, oh, how, how could you say that? It's just a spectrum of opinion in the United States. You can't say they're anti-American. Well, I think that actually the leftist Islamic alliance is an indication that Horowitz is right. And that they hate America, they hate Judeo-Christian civilization so much that they see this force, jihad, that has been allied, that has been working for the destruction of Judeo-Christian civilization for 1,400 years, and they're playing the enemy of my enemy is my friend game. And so we see that the principles that the left professes to stand for, it doesn't really stand for. Most notably with the feminists, that feminists say they're for women's rights and women's equality, but they had Linda Sarsour as one of the leading organizers of the Women's March protesting Trump, January 21st, 2017. Not 1917, that was the one I was at. But anyway, um, Linda Sarsour is a pro-Sharia Muslim woman who wears the hijab. And the thing about the hijab is it's just the opposite of standing for women's rights. There have been women who have been brutalized and killed for not wearing the hijab. Because the hijab is supposed to be the woman's responsibility to take away temptation away from the men. It's not the men's responsibility to control themselves. It's the women's responsibility to take them, make them not tempted. And so that's why they wear it. And so if they don't wear it, they are avoiding their responsibility. Aksa Parvez was a Muslim girl in, in uh, Mississauga, Ontario, in Canada, in 2007 or 8. And she was strangled to death by her father and brother with the hijab she refused to wear. So this ain't women's rights. 
and the fact that the feminist movement is completely folded and doesn't stand for girls like Aksa and the other women who've been oppressed and brutalized all over the world for not wearing the hijab, but instead is championing the hijab, it shows what they're really about is hating America and hating Judeo-Christian civilization. And the concern for women's rights is all really just a sham. Um, and a quick follow-up question. Do you think them being like maybe uneducated on the topic like, and you know the true history of jihad and stuff, do you think that plays into it as well? Or? Yeah, I think that there's massive misinformation and disinformation out there. People are always told that Islam is a religion of peace and all that, and they don't know. They, they, they haven't read the Quran. They believe it. I'll tell you, I was speaking, I was actually not speaking, I was standing there being yelled at at the University at Buffalo in New York last year. And I was yelled at for an hour and a half, yelled at, screamed at. The people there were very righteous and they knew that this terrible Islamophobe was coming. And so they made sure to show me just what a terrible person I was. And there was this one guy who was sitting over here and he had a sign that he was holding in front of him that said, Queers Against Islamophobia. And so I thought, wait a minute, I had a manual of Islamic law with me because I thought this is going to be a very hostile crowd. I'm just going to read out what Islamic law says and see what they say about that. So I read the, ma the manual of Islamic law where it says homosexuals need to be killed. And the whole place started to boo, boo. And I thought, what, you think I wrote that? You think that it's going to go away? if we pretend it doesn't exist, this guy holding up his little sign would be thrown off a roof in the lands that I, areas that ISIS controlled and killed or hanged by his neck on a crane in Iran. And yet he's standing with the people who would do that to him. And it's just insane. But uh, I do think that ultimately, yeah, he probably doesn't really have a clue. He thinks, oh, that's not really Islam. That's the twisted, hijacked version. And the real Islam is all unicorns and bunnies. But unfortunately, we haven't seen that version yet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, I'm Hello. Benjamin, and I'm homeschooled. Uh, you're who? I'm Benjamin. Benjamin, how you yes. doing? Um, I'm pretty good. So. My question relates to the nature of Islam, and from what you said, as long as there is one person who follows the true or the unrefined version of Islam that exists in the world, their goal will be to conquer any nations and submit them to Islam. And from that, would you agree that the only way to provide for everyone's safety is to end Islam in its pure form. Well, you're talking about a billion and a half people. So when you talk yeah. about ending Islam, what are you talking about? Camps, gas chambers? I mean, it becomes a very, very bad road to go down, you know? And actually in the United States, we don't actually have uh, laws against ideas. And we should all be very grateful for that. Although the left is working very hard now to make hate crime into a actual legal category, hate crime actually does not exist. Hate crime, the whole concept of hate crime is a tool of the powerful to silence their opposition by labeling it hate crime and then shutting it down. But read, have you read 1984? Yes. Okay, remember the thought police? Mm -hmm. The thought police, they come and get you if you're thinking the wrong thoughts. We don't have that in the United States. If people want to say Muhammad is a prophet and all that, that should not be against the law. Now, I've gotten people have given me a lot of flack for saying this, and they say, well, then how are you going to fight this? Are you saying we should coexist? Well, of course not. This is, uh, there's, that's not the alternative. Like I was saying, we, 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 what we do in the United States is we have criminalization of various behaviors. If female circumcision is a crime in the United States, we should prosecute it. If honor killing is a crime, if uh, plotting terrorist attacks, all these things, if we were to prosecute them more efficiently and more consistently and make it very clear that the, this kind of behavior is not protected under the First Amendment and is not welcome in the United States, a lot of this problem would go away. But yeah, you're right. As long as there are people who believe in the Quran and in Muhammad, there will be some jihadis. 
But in the past, as I show in the book actually, there have been periods where the problem was not as great as it is now because the opposition was strong. Not just militarily strong, but culturally and societally strong in a way that we are not now. So we need to recover that. But in any case, uh, yeah, I'm not in favor of, uh, I don't see any practicality to what you're saying, you see what I mean. Yeah. And I'm not in favor of criminalizing any ideas, but only prosecuting people who act in a way that is at variance with the principles of human rights to which this nation is committed. And then we would, if we did that, solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Nicoletta. Nicoletta? I, Nicoletta. Nicoletta, what yeah. a wonderful name, hello. Thank you. Hi, um, I go to Downey, and my question is, um, you know, you said that um, just because people are Muslim doesn't they mean they have to like practice all these violent laws or whatever, and a lot of people don't. And like, I know people at school who are Muslim, and they're like, I've had perfectly fun conversations with them, and they <coughs> seem like nice people. So my question is, uh, why, like these people that seem so nice, why would they want to be a part of something so violent? Like, do they just not know what they might not um, Islam truly is, or like, like how do they? Like, I don't, I don't get why would somebody want to follow that if they are like a good person. If you're born into something, then most people stay in it. There are people who leave the religious tradition in which they were born or in which their family was that they were surrounded with as they were very young. Most people don't. It's your social system. It's your family. It's, it's your frame of reference, you know? There's not any big inducement to leave it. Uh, at the same time, also, there is a great possibility that they might not know. Because Islam is a very interesting religion. It is interesting in many ways. But one of the ways in which it's interesting is that it is uh, very Arab-centric. Muhammad was an Arab, and he taught that uh, the Arabs should always be the caliphs, the people in charge. And the Quran is in Arabic. If you were to convert to Islam today, which I'm not recommending, then you would have to, you want to go and pray in the mosque, you have to pray in Arabic. And if you don't know Arabic, then it's good enough just to mouth along the syllables of the prayers. You've got to learn those. Most of the biggest Muslim countries today are not Arabic speaking. Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world today. They're not Arabs. Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, not Arabs. India actually has the second largest Muslim population in the world, not Arabs. So in Pakistan, if you go to the madrasa, the Islamic school, you might memorize the whole Quran and not have any idea what it's saying. And this is absolutely true. People think this is a joke when I tell them, but I knew a guy, Pakistani Muslim, a few years back, and one day he was telling me, I'm very proud of my religion, and I have memorized almost all of the Quran, and one day I intend to get one of those translations and find out what it means. And so the, he knows Islam from the preaching in his mosque on Friday, and if the preaching in his mosque on Friday doesn't touch on jihad war, he might not know it's in there. And he's always being told about Islamophobia, and he might think wicked people like me are just making it all up. And so your friends, of course, I don't know them, and I don't know what their particular situation is, but if they were born into it and they are not conversant in Arabic, which they may or may not be, and also, of course, modern standard Arabic is not the same thing as 7th century classical Quranic Arabic, then they uh, might not have any idea or any clear idea that these things are there, and they're taught generally just be kind to people and so on, as most people are taught, and so that's what they think that it's about. Okay, thanks. Tell them I'm not here. Mm -hmm.